Hello friends, I'm Ashish Tarbari, founder and CEO of Axiomize. And to our new listeners, welcome. And if you have joined us before, welcome back. In today's podcast, I'm going to be talking about the key drivers for maximizing verification ROI. Today, I'm going to look at broad challenges facing semiconductor verification and would like to explain how they've grown to leave us facing what I call a crisis of confidence. You know, there's been an astronomical growth in constrained random simulation, emulation, and FPGA prototyping. So why is it then that we're still grappling with poor quality verification, late running schedules, missing bugs? Why is that? In 2017, I wrote a series of blogs on this topic and I was reflecting on those articles recently. And it appears that a lot of these observations that I originally wrote in that blog are still quite relevant. So I decided to steal some of these observations from my original blog um, that were published on Tech Design Forum. And I wanted to review some of these and see what is it that we can do to maximize the verification return on investment. You know, understanding why verification is hard, uh, why does it leave uh, miss bugs and why does it leave the management frustrated? You know, so if you're a manager listening to this podcast, you may be able to relate to some of these artifacts. Or why does it leave the engineers stressed out and demotivated? So if you are an engineer like me, you might actually uh, relate to some of these observations. So in order to understand all of this a bit better, I want to introduce to you um, the concept of a verification meta model. So we need to understand that verification is never done in isolation. You know, it's a part of the bigger picture. It is one of the most expensive activities within any semiconductor design project. And its success or otherwise is heavily influenced by four components, all of which must interplay with each other. These components are the process, the verification technology, the verification methodology, and the engineers that use them. I will explain to you how managers and senior management fits into all of this. This quartet of the process, the verification technologies, the methodology, and the engineers is what I would like to call as the four pillars of the verification meta model. So just like the models used in engineering, this meta model assumes the presence of some inputs and produces outputs. And its behavior should reflect a predictable relationship that preserves these elements. Our meta model bases this relationship on a core, which is the process with the technology, the methodology, and the human engineers forming its primary inputs. Now, so that we are all on the same page, let me expand on the ideas behind each of the four pillars. So let's dive a little deep into what a process is. Process at a very high level can be seen as a series of actions that are executed to fulfill an end goal. You can think of a process as a description of concrete things that must be executed to carry out a task successfully. In our meta model, the task could be complex. It could, you know, may not just have to involve verification, but could also include tasks that are needed to enable verification. So here I'm actually thinking about people also who are actually involved in making this easier. So I'm talking about managers. For example, to grow expertise in one of the tasks could be one of the tasks could be training an engineer in a certain skill before he or she can become productive. So in our meta model, we can define process as a collection of heterogeneous tasks that need to be performed to obtain high quality verification. And most importantly, within project deadlines. So when I say high quality, what it means is finding as many bugs as possible and demonstrating that there are no bugs through possible formal proofs. So given my background and passion for formal verification, 
for me, obtaining formal proofs is as much an important um, criteria as finding bugs is. And we would like to do this earlier in the design cycle and ensuring that none leak through at the end of the project. Now let's take a look at verification technology. What we really mean is an application of a specific verification technique. So you are all familiar with dynamic simulation and constrained random simulation. So UVM based constrained random verification is an example of a technology. Now, in some cases, such as formal verification, the verification technology itself can be used to build exhaustive proofs of correctness. It can also be that you're using directed testing technique um, that is just uh, necessary to establish an SOC bring up. Other techniques that are useful for full system testing rely on emulation and FPGA prototyping. But effectively what we're talking about is a specific way uh, to solve a problem through a specific selection of tools. And that's a tool depends very much on the technology that is being used. The overall ethos guiding all aspects of verification as it relates to and interplays with the design process is usually the topic of methodology and we'll come to it a bit more in detail later. So whereas verification technology uh, typically outlines the core principles of how certain technology works in practice and provides tools such as simulators, emulators, model checkers, or FPGA platforms, methodology is necessary to ensure that the right application of a specific verification technique or a combination happens at the right time by the right set of people. So that's what is the goal of a good methodology. Now let's talk about us, design and verification engineers, the human beings responsible for building hardware designs correctly. Hopefully, as per the outline requirements without introducing or leaving bugs. So if you are a design engineer, a verification engineer, I'm talking about you. So the goal of a designer is to bring up the design, architect it, build it, and hopefully not introduce bugs in the design. If you're a verification engineer, however, responsibility is in flushing out all of the bugs in the design and establishing that there are no bugs at all through formal proofs, if you're using formal verification, of course. So why is the interaction of these four components so important in the meta model? And how can they be used so that we can avoid the breakdown in verification? So I believe that the verification practices in the industry are not scaling proportionate to the complexity of designs. And in order to avoid the breakdown in verification, what we need is to understand how to actually combine these four pillars to obtain the best possible solution, avoiding the breakdown. So what are the requirements of a good verification meta model? So in my view, a verification meta model should produce high quality verification efficiently using a process that uses a right combination of technologies and methodologies to maximize ROI and minimize risk. The goal is to find bugs or build proofs of bug absence early and throughout in the design verification cycle. So I'm passionate about formal. I would like to apply formal on a project, but that shouldn't be the only technology used on a particular project. It may be necessary to use simulation, combine simulation and formal in different ways. And that's what is the important consideration to make. So understanding that a verification meta model produces high quality verification efficiently and uses the process that describes how the right combination of technologies and methodologies are used seems quite straightforward enough, but in reality it isn't. If you look at the breakdown in verification, and why it actually happens, you would notice that the breakdown happens because of poor processes, causing lack of good planning, resulting in half-baked methodologies that get deployed by the DV engineers, causing everyone distress and frustration. Now, planning includes clearly defining both the high-level and the low-level verification goals and describing a specific sequence of concrete, specific actions that delivers them. The process, on the other hand, pulls together various different plans in such a way that they work together and complement each other. So a good verification plan needs to have 
detailed risk assessment and mitigation steps. And when verification breaks down, when you do not have these things carefully thought out in the way I described, the immediate response is that planning was not adequate. We of course expect good planning to fall out naturally from a good process, and in many organizations it does. The thing to note is that whereas planning is essential to achieve high quality verification goals, it is not a pillar of the meta model itself in the way the process is. Rather, a good process enables good planning, not the other way around. So if you see what I mean. Now let's take a look at the role of training and mentoring. So organizations should plan for training, design verification engineers and required verification skills, of course. But if we fail to define and implement plans for training new DV engineers, or if we fail to train experienced engineers on new verification techniques, then we will not obtain good results. And formal verification is a classic example of how poor training has actually impacted its use in the industry. The frequent lack of a verification training plan means that bright, talented engineers must work on verification without the appropriate skills. As a result, these engineers can unwittingly cause massive delays and the process will yield poorly verified designs. Or you can actually experience the worst of both. But what happens on the brighter side once the engineers have been trained, right? And where do they go after the training finishes? So the path from acquiring fresh skills to delivering production quality work can be long. And if you've actually not thought about how this is going to actually take you from training to accomplishing the project milestones, you are in big trouble. So how do organizations ensure that a trained engineer is able to apply her skills properly on actual projects? And the answer lies in good mentoring. I can tell you that when we train our customers, we offer them an opportunity to engage with us in hands-on consulting based on mentorship. We've spent years in the industry working on complex projects, and we're also passionate about training. So when we engage with our customers, we are not only training them on a specific course, but we're also allowing them to understand how these concepts can be scaled to the projects outside the training. So the customer can see for themselves how the training is applied in practice. The benefit of upfront training is in enabling everyone involved in the project to speak the same language and see things the same way. So not having specific well-drafted coursework is a bad idea. Just directly diving onto the projects and actually sitting with an individual engineer, a senior mentor can make that individual engineer become good at solving a set of problems on that project, but this is not a scalable process. And once that engineer moves on to a new project and faces a new set of problems, he may or may not be competent to take up those challenges. So intensive coursework project, coursework based on necessary theoretical details along with hands-on labs followed by immediate deployment on projects is our way, Xmi's way of empowering our customers through training and mentoring and consulting. And though training and mentoring may seem like an extra cost to a project, the benefits outperform this small added cost in the short term. And moreover, it outlives the project cost in the long term, where the investment typically pays off several times over when these engineers go on to do new projects. So when we talk about training, we're talking about methodology training and not tool training, which is often provided by the tool vendors, but is seldom adequate on its own. So let's talk about methodology a bit more, shall we? So there are several things to consider in designing a good methodology. It's a complex topic, so I can't go on and on for, on this for too long. But selection of problems, mapping problems to solutions, understanding how to adapt known solution to new problems, scoping impact of this adaptation, understanding risks, and measuring the overall ROI are all necessary components of any good methodology. Breaking down a big complex hard verification problem into meaningful smaller parts so that well understood solutions can be mapped to these smaller parts is the folklore of a good tool independent methodology. Applying tools to solve well understood problems is an important aspect of a good tool based methodology. Another example that comes to mind is that for many years the use of assertion based verification IPs has been in practice for verifying bus protocol designs. 
has been a rather well understood problem solution map. But who would have thought that the same methodology can be adapted for verifying processors as we have shown in Axiomize through our new RISC V formal proof kit? Right? So here you go, it's a well established methodology in a specific area of a problem. We've adapted this to processors. So the lack of a good methodology can have a debilitating effect on projects, even when there is an investment providing good training in different verification technologies. And therefore, methodology itself needs to take center stage for driving great verification, maximizing the ROI. So in our future podcast, we'll continue to talk about methodology in more detail, specifically formal verification methodology. But for now, I would like to wrap up and I would like you to remember that a good process and careful planning are the top two key drivers in resolving most of the challenges of verification. So I hope you like today's podcast. To subscribe to our YouTube channel and ping us at info@axiomize.com with questions, suggestions, feedback, and we'll get back to you next week. Stay home and stay safe. Goodbye. <laughs>